Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Foundry Stand for our presentation on the film The Blues Crowd. Ari and I met two years ago at a visual effects conference in Bournemouth, England, where we shared a mutual love for the music of Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and from that point on decided to venture into this animation together. It's an art film, and it brings together a team from around the world, a team of freelancers who are working together as artists who love what they do. So in a sense, it's art for the sake of art. You'll see the team is gathered really quite worldwide, and it's quite a unique setup to bring together this film. The film is set in Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, USA, where Ari Rubenstein grew up as a child and played and fished for blue crabs and, and enjoyed the atmosphere which we've hoped to bring to life in this animation. We are very pleased to present to you our trailer for the film uh, for the first time. And here it is for you. So we hope you enjoy and afterwards we will pass over to Ari who will tell you visual people <laughs> how the visuals were put together. So we'd like to present our trailer. Please bar. Ari Rubenstein. Uh, all right, it's quite a thrill to be here after 25 years of attending SIGGRAPH and being on the floor sharing an uh, original piece of, of work. Um, I, the, sh the short film, The Blues Crab, was rendered entirely in V-Ray for Nuke. I chose to do so because I really wanted to see what it couldn't do, which wasn't much. My primary goal was to push 3D rendering within a compositing app in order to further look development efforts. As you can see, this is our toolbox. I'm a bit of a techno junkie and love stitching together all this off-the-shelf software. What I'm going to start with is an overview of the entire pipeline relative to the crabs I'm calling life of a crab to focus on what our requirements were upstream in order to facilitate all that's needed to work effectively in V-Ray for Nuke. I started out looking for any assets I could find which I wouldn't have to generate First one I found was a high-res 3D scan of a blues crab, a blue crab, for free download on the Smithsonian website. Using quad modeling features in Maya, I traced the scan to produce a low-res animation-friendly version of this. Then in ZBrush, I imported both the low-res model and the high-res scan, subdivided the low-res geo, and using the ZProject brush, 
proceeded to paint in all the high-risk scan details, after which UVs were generated in ZBrush and displacement maps and geo were exported for painting in MARI. In MARI, we spent a lot of time creating very detailed textures and custom mats to facilitate look development in comp. Taking cues from a lot of reference photography I took with family trips back to the Chesapeake Bay, taking my kids crabbing and whatnot that I had done for 20 years growing up. Then augmenting our displacement maps to add specific character details. You notice the uh, blues crab's old war wound on the top of his shell and his weary brow like lines of age directly behind his eyes. Uh, lastly, for texturing in Maya, we offset all the different texture maps corresponding UVs into different UDIM spaces. This will allow for a single multi-part geo alembic to have a single UDIM texture sequence applied in Nuke from one read node instead of many separate ones for each texture map. This greatly reduces the labor for updating textures and animation with successive iterations. Of course, we still needed an animation rig set up in Maya that we hand off to the animators. And since the UVs and UDIMs are properly in place in our propagated reference file, when we get the animation back, we can simply export a single alembic and render in V-Ray for Nuke without any further per-shot adjustments. Now that we have our shot camera and characters animated and exported into alembic caches, we can set up our V-Ray for Nuke workflow. What you see here are the bare bones of using V-Ray and Nuke. At the top, you'll see the V-Ray text bitmap node. This is for all textures. Below that, the V-Ray material node for shader development. Top left is the V-Ray proxy node for all imported geometry. V-Ray displacement and V-Ray object prop node in the middle. An object properties node uh, is a great utility for controlling GI, shadows, setting up object IDs for mats, and much more. Below that is V-Ray render elements, which is an exhaustive list of predefined AOVs that make any comp or drool. No setup needed. They're ready to roll. On that note, here's a set of render elements I output with V-Ray defaults and a few custom mat channels for use in look developing the crabs. Uh, now, after you have your lighting where you want it in V-Ray, in Nuke, and you've done your look dev utilizing your raw lighting renders and testing your AOVs and compositing, then you're ready to render. Uh, when lighting in V-Ray for Nuke, uh, then compositing also in Nuke, you might think you do it all in the same script. Of course, they're all in the same program, um, but each of us finds our uh, most efficient way to get the job done. Uh, I found it easier to have one script for lighting, another for comp, for a faster workflow. Either way, when you're ready to render and if you're considering cloud rendering, here is our workflow, which was incredibly straightforward. First, you export your scene with the V-Ray translator node, which creates an all-in-one V-Ray scene file. This file can be uploaded for cloud rendering or rendered locally in a V-Ray stand eh, standalone V-Ray session without Nuke. Uh, we use the cloud rendering service Yellow Dog out of Bristol, England. They provide a full soup to nuts cloud rendering so solution where jobs are submitted directly in Nuke. Then you utilize their render queue pop-up for management of all your render jobs. I literally sent complex thousand frame shots right when I woke up in the morning, got out of the shower, strolled downstairs, and all frames were rendered and downloaded to my local hard drive within an hour. And I did this probably a dozen times, and I <laughs> there was just no delay. I, I, I think uh, Yellow Dog is not like your average cloud rendering solution. They're a hub that uses all these other cloud rendering vendors, and they distribute smartly to all these and get a lot more uh, flow through doing it that way as a hub versus a singular um, data center. After the character workflow was figured out, the next big hurdle was how to push through a variety of naturalistic effects rendered in Nuke. Everyone around kept asking why, and the answer is, I want to control the effects in comp because I feel it's more intuitive which elements I'll need for look dev and how I specifically want them rendered. For instance, I like to create supplemental passes to employ specific comp techniques, which aren't that obvious and intuitive to an effects artist who isn't as familiar with comp look development. I worked at Chaos over 25 years ago, 20 years, and uh, comp and effects were the same thing. Um, a lot of studios have stratified and they have specialists in each of these regions, and 
And even the, the time frame of which each department gets their inventory is a little different. But to me, effects have to be influenced by what the final technique is used in comp for look development. And so um, having V-Ray and Nuke and being able to take a simulation, say a VDB sequence or whatever, and output something that doesn't look like a standard VFX element, but something that you would use, let's say, for displacement in comp or a whole variety of, of comp-specific techniques for look development is incredibly advantageous if controlled or directed by a compositor. For water, we had to ray trace reflections and refractions for over and underwater surfaces. Here are a few raw renders along with the final shots, all rendered in Nuke with V-Ray. These are the raw renders and the final shot. Uh, the method was employed. The method employed was to output very high-resolution meshes as alembic caches from Houdini. Um, these were all in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 gigabytes each, if not more. And standard Nuke bringing that in would crash, you know, uh, in an incredibly frustrating way. But the great part was that the V-Ray proxy node does real-time mesh decimation and deferred rendering. This gives you a, just enough poly count to see the volume and position it in Nuke's 3D space, but not so much which would bog down your comp without using V-Ray. For volumetric effects uh, developed by artists using Houdini, they would deliver VDB caches, and I'd render them in Nuke with the V-Ray volume grid. It was pretty surprising how fast these renders were. Here's the visualization of the VDB volume in Nuke's 3D viewport. It's not much, but it's enough for you to gather the volume, you can, see th you can see the shading of velocity, and, um, and then the final rendered element, and then comped into the shot. The Blues Crab was as much about creative expression as it was innovation. To that end, I collaborated with several developers whose work was complementary to what I was doing in the film. For the Silt effects, I partnered with Intraware and Vortex Effects, who make Eddy for Nuke. Eddy is a cutting edge fluid dynamics volumetric tool for Nuke. I struck up a creative relationship with Intraware's artist Mar Matt Barker, who provided dozens of shots of ocean floors silt kicked up by the crabs. And by the way, they're right across the way. The video here shows several uh, effects fluid renders with the Eddy renderer inside Nuke, along with their corresponding close to final shots. Nothing is final. The final of the film is going to premiere in England in about a month from now, so they're still working. I'm not going too much into Eddie, but again, they're right across the way. Matt's right there. Uh, please go talk to them if you're interested uh, in this GPU accelerated fluid rendering engine with a nuke, which is just uh, phenomenal. I mean, 80% of the film is underwater, if, if not more. And, and Matt was able to kick out. I just sent him Alembic caches. He used them for, uh, for velocity, for collision, for what have you, and uh, it just worked beautifully. Another key effects element needed to sell the underwater look was flotsam. Uh, this was achieved with Nuke's particle system. The challenge was how to minimize the additional rendering required to hold out the particles for all the complex scene geo. And as we needed flotsam in nearly every shot in the movie, this was no small matter. Uh, I started out for quite a while just bringing in the geometry, giving it a fill map material, and the, you know, for 80 shots, so it was 85 shots in the film, but maybe. 70 shots had flotsam. Uh, it was just bogging down the renders, and um, a friend showed me another method, which the solution was to render the flotsam part of, without any geometry in cut, uh, uncut, 
And that would be, I could have 400 frame shots that would render literally in five minutes when it was just the particles. Uh, then Z mat the lighting depth with the depth of the particle render. Um, uh, and in my haste, uh, though I'd render dozens of shots, uh, only to find I'd set the V-Ray render with normalized Z-depth. With V-Ray, you can render normalized or keep it float. Um, a, a, fortunately, even though I'd actually I'd rendered uh, without deep data, you can convert your depth uh, without any deep data render. You can convert uh, with deep from image node, um, then use the deep merge to essentially Z-mat the particles. This does require expanding out the normalized depth uh, beforehand, so the data is the same from both sources. But either way, if you had thought of this from scratch, uh, you would you wouldn't have to render out deep data. You'd have the same depth from both sources. Cut it afterwards with this real simply simple layout, um, and you save infinite amount of rendering time. As opposed, I mean, I had rendered caches of you know 12 gigabytes of animated kelp over 500 frames and seagrass and all kinds of things, and that was a real nice turn. Um, I'd like to share the before and after result. So here's a look at the shot. Um, notice uh, Willie, the squid in the middle. And notice how the holdouts work. So here I've upped the count, particle count way higher than I actually used just to demonstrate the deep merge operation. This is the raw nuke particle render under, uncut by the geo, which renders incredibly fast, versus the geo in render after the deep merge with a holdout. Um, none of the geometry in render. And the final shot. <laughs> and you might say there, you can barely see the particles, but it's a texture. It's something you're supposed to feel to know you're underwater as opposed to being as obvious as you might uh, think. So for lighting, I first work on the shaders per object and generate nuke stacks for each character and set piece, which are staved in a Blue Crab tool set, one of the nice features and probably underutilized features in Nuke for propagation into other shots. Uh, at, at the end of the day, I had to do 85 shots, all the lighting and rendering myself, and so I wanted to figure out ways to propagate lighting and rendering um, in a way that wouldn't just absolutely kill me and get me divorced. Um, so here's another example of uh, the kelp asset. And in Maya, we can just change the layout of the kelp export an Alembic and plug it into this nuke stack for each shot. Um, earlier I mentioned we split the nuke lighting script from the nuke final comp script. And here you can see the V-Ray for nuke lighting setup. Notice all the individual character and set piece stacks combined with a light rig and render elements set up below. One for each shot rendered into a multi-channel EXR. So now let's head over to Nuke to show how we propagated each shot with predefined tool sets similar to how tool sets are used in lighting. All right, so in Nuke, um, for all of the 85 shots, I utilize as Nuke tool sets. So really, you can, you can sit there and do your lighting look dev, you can do your comp look dev and create stacks for, let's say, the sh um, you know, you, you've, for each element, you have... For kelp, you've already worked out the shaders. You've rendered a multi-channel EXR with all the render elements and the AOVs. And so you're bringing in a single um, uh, read node of an EX multi-channel EXR, and then you're splitting that out. And then you've developed your color corrections to create continuity throughout all the shots. Um, I did this in lighting and the same set setup in Nuke. So in Nuke, I created um, in lighting and in comp. Um, so if I go to comp, I, I can build each of my 85 scripts just with these different setups. If you think of underwater, there was a, a, at least four different uh, atmospheric effects that had to be there for every shot to give this look. I had to do caustics, uh, atmo underwater, uh, volumetric rays from the light coming from above because this is a pier and it's in a bay and we're you know, 10 to 15 feet below water, um, the flotsam. Um, so I had separate renders in V-Ray for Nuke for the caustics rendered from, like a caustics looping texture projected from a V-Ray light onto the entire set. I had the flotsam, as I just described, uh, rendered on its own and a deep merge together. Um, the rays were a volumetric, um, it wasn't even volumetric, it was a um, sort of a noise card 
with um, a, a blurred out put onto um, projection cards into Nuke from each camera. Uh, and I set those all up into these tool sets and I could assemble it in a very nice way. So here we've got just the V-Ray for Nuke uh, render. We've got the depth element. We have all these different uh, extra textures. If you've got UVs on all your scene, you can, you can apply a single texture based on the UDIMs. It'll apply to everything in the scene, but then you hold it inside you know, each of the characters. Um, Multimat is a way of assigning IDs to every element and then being able to um, break them out and do color corrections to get everything in continuity. Uh, and if you just always do all the kelp as one, all the seagrass as one, you can then create these tool sets that will build a comp script that has nice continuity. So if I just build a script here, I've got, I've just got the lighting. Um, I, I created a little light uh, uh, eye tool so you can see what's going on with the eyes before, before and after. Um, I can go after the eyes, put on uh, a set. So this is all these different AOVs. Um, ID mats basically rented out with different color corrections based on all the shots. So if we just take that with the raw render with the eyes, um, we affect the rocks. We do a little bit of detail onto the tonal range of the rocks. Uh, we pump up the uh, the highs of the kelp to give it tonal range. We push the color around for the the ground floor. Um, and we push a little bit more into the blues crab for gamma. Go to the next piece. Uh, caustics. So if you look at the caustics, that's rendered on its own. If I push up the gamma, you can see how it plays across it. Um, I pull depth keys to push the caustics be, be in front and behind, uh, put those all together, give them a little bit of chromatic aberration. You can hardly see it here, but as the whole thing comes together, all these pieces add up and create the in inherent look. Um, then we got the depth coming in. We're color correcting the depth and leveling it around. So we went from that to that. Atmo, a little bit of Promist from the, from the characters and the, uh, a lot of little subtle effects, but when you add them all together, they, they generate a look that's, I think, pleasing. Um, DOF, I uh, use Paragon Labs uh, bouquet tool, uh, and that was nice. I wanted everything to be, have a real shallow depth of field, and the tool was brilliant for that. Um, let's see, rays. A little difficult to do this in real time, but uh, bear with me. Flotsam. So Flotsam was uh, a bunch of individual pieces of art thrown through a particle system. Um, deep merged together, given a look with um, with the focus based on the same to focus depth slicing that was used for the character in the set. Uh, chromatics. So now things at the end were just I built a little chromatics tool to give it. Um, actually, make this a little bit more visible. Um, then uh, inherent diffusion that would be underwater. Almost done. And then grain. I... So grain and a little bit of post color correction. I you know I, I've worked at Blue Sky Studios for 13 years. Um, I've I've admired 
uh, Blue Sky, Pixar, DreamWorks, uh, Animal Logic, and all the animated films. I, I've always felt that they're very clean, and it's, it's beautiful work. But I have always wanted to create something that's a little bit more textured, a little bit more like 70s celluloid, beating it up, kind of like George Lucas did with Star Wars, where he wanted everything to feel worn. Uh, and so we endeavored to do this with this film, from Ben's music choices and his texture to really just beating up the frame and not worrying about every last little pixel detail, but just making it feel a little bit more real. So that's the entirety of look development. If you look at the comp, going from the V-Ray for Nuke render all the way to the bottom. Um, and then maybe we'll just switch over, show you the trailer one more time so you can see the result of all this again with perspective, and maybe we can do some Q&A after. Thank you for coming.